students, Mrs. Dukoski here, Camila, Camila. We're here to read chapter 10, Catcher in the Rye, and talk about what's going on in Holden's life. He's in his rebellion chapters, which we all love, right? So we'll find him in a minute, but before I'm going to commit to um, reading Catcher, I'm going to just do a be now with you. So again, the idea of the be now is that wherever we are as we come to these lessons, um, you need to gain some focus. So I am a big um, fan of practicing yoga and meditation and movement. And some of, if you do some of the research, some of the reasons why people originally practiced yoga was because the physical asanas or exercises helped them to have some mental clarity. So when they would sit for their learning or for their meditations, they didn't feel like they needed to move around and be distracted because they'd sort of gotten that out in a physical practice first. So that's really the intention of the Bina, wherever you are, just coming in, centering yourself, doing a few physical movements so that when we sit for a good half hour to do our learning videos and our reading, you've kind of approached it from a place where you're, you've limited your distractions and you're there with the purpose to learn this lesson about Catcher in the Rye. So we're going to go through today just a quick sun salutation. So sun salutations are like the um, basic how most people begin a yoga practice. And there's different types of sun salutation. We'll just go through a really basic sun salutation A. So you come to stand. You can have a mat, but you don't have to have a mat. Um, you can just stand somewhere where you would be able to you know, spread out wide enough to do some movement. So you're standing, your feet are close together or touching, your shoulders are rolled up, back and down, your hands face forward. And as you inhale, you sweep your arms up, you gaze up, you exhale and you fold forward. Your hands can come to your shins or maybe they come all the way down to the floor and let your head hang down. And just here, rock for a minute. You should have a soft bend behind your knees and just kind of rock into and take some breath into any places that feel a little bit tight. So just find a little movement here in a forward fold. You can gaze forward for a second and then bend back in, see if you can maybe, you know, go a little bit deeper. Again, the idea is not to strain, it's to open. So find some movement, take some breath. Then we're gonna bend our knees, place our hands on the floor, step the right foot back, step the left foot back. This is where you find that plank pose we've been working on in our other videos. You can come to your knees. Let's see here. So you can either be in full plank or you can be on your knees or, you know, a variation of both. So in my plank pose, I'm going to just lower all the way down slowly, my elbows scrape my ribs, my belly's on the mat, I inhale up for a little cobra, so my hands are just pressing into the mat, my elbows are by my side, and I inhale up for a little cobra, I'm going to exhale down, I'm going to come back to a child's pose, just push back to child pose, it's a nice, nice way to just be in your body. Nice and gentle, take a couple breaths where you feel your back puffing up. Inhaling through the nose deeply, exhale. You can exhale out your mouth if you want, like a nice sigh of relief. Inhales come through the nose. And again, exhale maybe out your mouth, like a sigh of relief. You're letting go of any tension you brought with you to this, this moment. One more deep breath. And then we're gonna push into downward dog. So downward dog, you just pedal, this is upside down V. My hands, um, my fingers are wide. They're about shoulder width apart in front of me on my mat. My feet are about hips width apart behind me. And I'm just gonna pedal for a couple of breaths. And then I'm gonna start to slowly walk forward so that my feet, come to the front of my space and my hands are hanging down again they can come to my shins or the floor my head drops one last time for a nice forward fold you can bend your knees 
And then I'm gonna inhale and do this nice reverse swan dive. Oops. <laughs> like a nice reverse swan dive, really big, really big, really big, all the way up to the top of my mat. I'm gonna bring my hands down. I'm gonna take one last check in with my breath. I like to put a hand on my heart, a hand on my belly. I'm gonna take a nice deep breath. So the breath comes through your nose. You should feel your belly puff out, your chest rise, and even the breath comes to the back of your throat a little bit. And then you exhale slowly, the chest lowers, the belly draws up and in until all of your air is out of your body. So try a couple of those. You can open your eyes or close them. If your eyes are open, find a place to gaze at. Go for three of them, really deep, big, long breaths. Noticing if anything's distracting you, you're just letting it move to the side, like a cloud rolling across the sky, wave in the ocean. Awesome. So that was just a basic sun salutation. If you're in a yoga class, you do a bunch more, but we're in a, a class where we're gonna read a chapter of Catcher in the Rye. So we're gonna come to our lesson now. And again, you might need to move space. I took the advantage of coming outside today because it's kind of cloudy and it's nice and peaceful. Maybe you hear the birds or there's some soft rain falling. So I thought it was a nice background for us. With that said, find your space today where you can be comfortable and sit for about 30 minutes to read Catcher in the Rhyme. So go ahead and find that space and then we'll get started. I'll get into the screen share. And again, I am proud of you for trying these little movements before we, and breath and meditation exercises. Before we get started, they're brief, but they do kind of help you regulate your your body and your mind and your emotions and bring it all together so that you can be your best self and pay attention as you begin your learning and i do recommend it not just for this class but for any class that you're taking or any activity where you need to be focused there are other things you can do but these are just you know some ideas so here we are we're in our chapter 10 lesson so we've made it all the way to chapter 10. Here's my folder. Again, you have a Schoology folder, a Catcher in the Rye. Looks something like this. You're gonna find your Catcher chapter 10 lesson notes. I'll pull them up. And we'll just look through them so you can have an idea of where we're heading. And I'll leave the gentle sound of the rain on this time. Hopefully you hear it. If not, you can imagine it, the imagery, right? The soft rain. So here's chapter 10 notes. We did our get focused. We took a few breaths. We did what's called a sun salutation. So even if you don't get into the practice of yoga, you should, you know, just have the, the cultural knowledge that that's called a sun salutation. If you need some review before we hop into chapter 10, Chapter nine review of Catcher is right here. They're really quick review videos. I recommend them. And then we get into chapter 10. So for chapter 10, we're like getting toward the middle of this story. Chapter 10, Holden's in New York City now. In the last chapter, he got a hotel room. It was, the hotel's called the Edmont. Oh, here comes the rain. I think you can maybe hear it now if you, you hadn't been able to hear it. Um, so that'll add something to the reading of this chapter. So in this chapter, we're going to focus on that theme of rebellion, right? So Holden is rebelling, rebelling right now against the conformity that his society was just encouraging and placing on him as a teenager, which all of us can relate to at different times in our life, and especially um, those years, those impressionable years that you're in as teenagers where people just want you to choose a path, right? Pick a path. Why wouldn't you choose a path? And, you know, maybe your parents or other adults in your life are kind of pushy about certain paths. And, and Holden's feeling that. And he 
is hating it. It's like giving him conflict and anxiety and he feels depressed and he feels isolated and like an outcast because he doesn't want that. And he sees some other kids it works pretty well for, but he's not that kid. It's not working for him. The suggestions of conformity in his 1950s, you know, upper class New York life, life here that he's, he's struggling with. And a lot of you would say, well, you know, What's so bad about all of this that his society is pushing on him? Doesn't he want to be successful? And I would question you, I'd push back and say, well, define success. You know, think about what is success? Um, is success doing things the way everybody else wants you to do them? Is that success? Is success following a roadmap that everybody else follow the most popular path the most well-worn path or you know are we gonna take different paths are we gonna reevaluate and figure out what paths are best for us and that's where holden is and that's called an existential crisis and i do ask you to maybe even pause and take that into consideration because i'm sure some of that goes on in our own personal lives where we feel pressure to stay on a path that maybe isn't the path that we want to be on. So with that, we will get into this chapter. So he's rebelling. He's like, forget this path. I don't want this. I want to do something different. And in the meantime, I'm gonna go have a little fun in New York City. So we'll see what that means. So it's a great place to go have fun, right? And I mean, it's notorious for being one of the, you know, city that doesn't sleep and the entertainment center of the world, right? So he's there and he is not going to waste time. So he's going to leave his hotel room. It's still Saturday night. It's later in the night, but again, New York doesn't sleep. So he goes outside his hotel room. Actually, this one is inside the hotel. He goes to a place called the Lavender Room, which if you can picture a hotel, and this is a hotel in a city, right? So if you can picture a hotel in a city, um, the lobby where you would check in, oftentimes there's some sort of restaurant um, at the and near where you would check in at a restaurant. There's some sort of like, you know, at where you would check in at a hotel. So that's what the Lavender Room is. The Lavender Room is like the restaurant bar club in the, the lobby, the bottom floor of this hotel that Holden is staying in. So he doesn't have to go that far to find his first, you know, attempt to have a good time. So that's where we're going to head right now. And we'll see what kind of excitement he can find in this Lavender Room Club at the hotel. And then we'll talk about, after we read it, some of the things that, you know, he bumps into. So with that, get into your story. Again, the PDFs in Schoology, chapter 10 starts on page 36 if you want to queue it up you can pause the video if you need to and here we go so this is moments later still saturday night it was still pretty early i'm not sure what time it was but it wasn't too late the one thing i hate to do is go to bed when i'm not even tired so i opened my suitcases and took out a clean shirt and then i went in the bathroom and washed and changed my my shirt <clears throat> what i thought i'd do I thought I'd go downstairs and see what the hell was going on in the lavender room. They had this nightclub, the lavender room, in the hotel. While I was changing my shirt, I damn near gave my kid sister Phoebe a buzz, though. I certainly felt like talking to her on the phone. Somebody with sense and all. But I couldn't take a chance on giving her a buzz, because she was only a little kid and she wouldn't have, she wouldn't have been up, let alone anywhere near the phone. I thought of maybe hanging up if my parents answered but that wouldn't have worked either. They'd know it was me. My mother always knows it's me. She's psychic, but I certainly wouldn't have minded shooting the crap with old Phoebe for a while. You should see her. You never saw a little kid so pretty and smart in your whole life. She's really smart. I mean, she's had all A's ever since she started school. As a matter of fact, I'm the only dumb one in my family. My brother DB's a writer at all, and my brother Allie, the one who died that I told you about was a wizard. I'm only, I'm the only real dumb one, but you ought to see old Phoebe. She has this sort of red hair, a little bit like Allie's, that's very short in the summertime. In the summertime, she sticks it behind her ears. 
She has nice, pretty little ears. In the wintertime, she's really, it's really pretty long. Sometimes my mother braids it, and sometimes she doesn't. It's really nice, though. She's only 10. She's quite skinny like me, but nice skinny. Roller skate skinny. I watched her once from the window when she was crossing over Fifth Avenue to go to the park, and that's what she is, roller skate skinny. You'd like her. I mean, if you tell old Phoebe something, she knows exactly what the hell you're talking about. I mean, you can even take her anywhere with you. If you take her to a lousy movie, for instance, she knows it's a lousy movie. If you take her to a pretty good movie, she knows it's a pretty good movie. DB and I took her to see this French movie, The Baker's Wife, with Remu in it. It killed her. Her favorite is The 39 Steps, though, with Robert Donet. She knows the whole goddamn movie by heart because I've taken her to see it about 10 times. When old Donet and all Phoebe will say right out loud in the movie, right when the Scott, oh sorry, when old Donet comes up to the Scotch farmhouse, for instance, when he's running away from the cops and all, Phoebe will say right out loud in the movie, right when the Scotch guy in the picture says it, can you eat the herring? She knows all the talk by heart. And when this professor in the picture that's really a German spy sticks up his little pointer finger with part of the middle joint missing to show Robert Donet old Phoebe, to show Robert Donet, old Phoebe beats him to it. She holds up her little finger at me in the dark, right in front of my face. She's all right. You'd like her. Only trouble is she's a little too affectionate sometimes. She's very emotional for a child. She really is. Something else she does, she writes books all the time. Only she doesn't finish them. They're all about some kid named Hazel Weatherfield. Only old Phoebe spells it Hazel. Old Hazel Weatherfield is a girl detective. She's supposed to be an orphan, but her old man keeps showing up. The old man's always a tall, attractive gentleman about 20 years of age. That kills me. Old Phoebe, I swear to God, you'd like her. She was smart even when she was a very tiny kid. She was a very tiny little kid. I and Allie used to take her to the park with us, especially on Sundays. Allie had this sailboat he used to like to fool around with on Sundays, and we used to take old Phoebe with us. She'd wear white gloves and walk right between us, like a lady and all. And when Allie and I were having some conversations about things in general, old Phoebe be listening. Sometimes you'd forget she was around because she was such a little kid, but she'd let you know. She'd interrupt you all the time. She'd give Allie or I a push or something and say, Who? Who said that? Bobby or the lady? And we'd tell her who said it, and she'd say, Oh, and go right on listening and all. She killed Allie, too. I mean, he liked her, too. She's ten now, and not such a little kid anymore. But she still kills everybody. Everybody with any sense, anyway. I'm going to stop the share, because I want to show you this crazy pouring rain. And why not? Because that's fun. Here I am. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see all this rain? Crazy. I think you can probably hear it. This is imagery, right? So that sound that you're maybe hearing is all this rain coming down, it's getting a little more gentle. It's really cool. I have a, a front porch that I appreciate greatly that I can sit on in rainstorms and, and watch them. So it's kind of one of, one of my favorite things to do. So here I am. I hope that you enjoy it too. So back to the story. He was describing his 10 year old sister. We'll move on from that. He was thinking of calling her. He's not going to, he's gonna go out, let's go. Holden's going to the lavender room. So here, anyway, she was somebody you always felt like talking to on the phone. But I was too afraid my parents would answer. And then they'd find out I was in New York and kicked out of Pensy and all. So I just finished putting on my shirt. Then I got all ready and went down in the elevator to the lobby to see what was going on. Except for a few pimpy looking guys and a few hoary looking blondes, the lobby was pretty empty. You could hear the band playing in the lavender room. And so I went in there. It wasn't very crowded, but they gave me a lousy table anyway, way in the back. I should have waved a buck under the head waiter's nose. In New York, boy, money really talks. I'm not kidding. The band was putrid. Buddy Singer, very brassy, but not good brassy. Horny brassy. Also, there were very few people around my age in the place. In fact, nobody was around my age. They were mostly old, show-offy looking guys with their dates, except at the table right next to me. At the table right next to me, there were these three girls around 30 or so. 
The whole three of them were pretty ugly and they all had on the kind of hats that you knew they didn't really live in New York. But one of them, the blonde one, wasn't too bad. She was sort of cute, the blonde one. And I started giving her the old eye a little bit, but just then the waiter came up for my order. I ordered a scotch and soda and told him not to mix it. I said it fast as hell, because if you hem and haw, they think you're under 21 and won't sell you any intoxicating liquor. I had trouble with him anyway, though. I'm sorry, sir, he said, but do you have some verification of your age, your driver's license, perhaps? I gave him this very cold stare, like he'd insulted the hell out of me, and asked him, do I look like I'm under 21? I'm sorry, sir, but we have our... Okay, okay, I said. I figured the hell with it. Bring me a Coke. He started to go away, but I called him back. Can't you stick a little rum in it or something? I asked him. I asked him very nicely and all. I can't sit in a corny place like this cold sober. Can't you stick a little rum in it or something? I'm very sorry, sir, he said, and beat it out and beat it on me. I didn't hold it against him, though. They lose their jobs if they caught, get caught selling to a minor. I'm a goddamn minor. I started giving the three witches at the next table the eye. That is, the blonde one. The other two were strictly for hum from hunger. I didn't do it crudely, though. I just gave all three of them this very cool glance and all. What they did, though, the three of them, when I did it, they started giggling like morons. They probably thought I was too young to give anybody the once over it. That annoyed the hell out of me. You'd have thought I wanted to marry them or something. I should have given them the freeze after they did that, but the trouble was, I really felt like dancing. I'm very fond of dancing sometimes, and that was one of the times. So all of a sudden, I sort of leaned over and said, would any of you girls care to dance? I didn't ask them crudely or anything. Very suave, in fact. But, God damn it, they thought that was a panic, too. They started giggling some more. I'm not kidding. They were three real morons. Come on, I said. I'll dance with you one at a time. All right, how about it? Come on. I really felt like dancing. Finally, the blonde one got up to dance with me because you could tell I was really talking to her and we walked out to the dance floor. The other two gruels nearly had hysterics when we did. I certainly must have been very hard up to even bother with any of them, but it was worth it. The blonde was some dancer. She was one of the best dancers I ever danced with. I'm not kidding. Some of these very stupid girls can really knock you out on a dance floor. You take a really smart girl and half the time she's trying to lead you around the dance floor or else she's such a lousy dancer. The best thing to do is stay at the table and just get drunk with her. You really can dance, I told the blonde one. You ought to be a pro. I mean it. I danced with a pro once and you're twice as good as she was. Did you ever hear of Marco and Miranda? What? She said. She wasn't even listening to me. She was looking all around the place. I said, did you ever hear of Marco and Miranda? I don't know. No, I didn't. I don't know. Well, they're dancers. She's a dancer. She's not too hot, though. She does everything she's supposed to, but she's not so hot anyway. You know when a girl's really a terrific dancer? What'd you say? She said. She wasn't listening to me, even. Her mind was wandering all over the place. I said, do you know when a girl's really a terrific dancer? Uh-uh. Well, where I have my hand on your back, I think there isn't anything, if I think there isn't anything underneath my hand, no can, no legs, no feet, no anything, then the girl's really a terrific dancer. She wasn't listening, though, so I ignored her for a while. We just danced. God, could that dopey girl dance. Buddy Singer and his stinky, stinking band was playing just one of those things, and even they couldn't ruin it entirely. It's a swell song. I didn't try any trick stuff while we danced. I hate a guy that does a lot of show-offy, tricky stuff on the dance floor, but I was moving her around plenty, and she stayed with me. Funny thing is, I thought she was enjoying it too, till all of a sudden she came out with this very dumb remark. I and my girlfriend saw Peter Lorre last night, she said. The movie actor. In person. He was buying a newspaper. He's cute. You're lucky, I told her. You're really lucky. You know that? She was really a moron. But what a dancer. I could hardly stop myself from sort of giving her a kiss on the top of her dopey head, you know, right where the part is and all. She got sore when I did it. Hey, what's the idea? Nothing. No idea. You really can dance, I said. I have a kid sister that's only in goddamn fourth grade. You're about as good as she is, and she can dance better than anybody living or dead. Watch your language, if you don't mind. What a lady boy, a queen, for Christ's sakes. Where you girls come from? I asked her. She didn't answer me, though. She was busy looking around for old Peter Laurie to show up.
I guess. Where you girls come from? I asked her again. What? She said. Where you girls come from? Don't answer if you don't feel like it. I don't want you to strain yourself. Seattle, Washington, she said. She was doing me a big favor to tell me. You're a very good conversationalist, I told her. You know that? What? I let it drop. It was over her head anyway. Do you feel like jitterbugging a little bit if they play a fast one? Not corny jitterbug, not jump or anything, just nice and easy. Everybody will all sit down when they play a fast one, except the old guys and the fat guys, and we'll have plenty of room, okay? It's immaterial to me, she said. Hey, how old are you? Anyhow, that annoyed me for some reason. Oh, Christ, don't spoil it, I said. I'm 12, for Christ's sake. I'm big for my age. Listen, I told you about that. I don't like that type of language, she said. If you're going to use that type of language, I can go sit with my gal, my girlfriends, you know. I apologized like a madman because the band was starting a fast one. She started jitterbugging with me, but just very nice and easy, not corny. She was really good. All you had to do was touch her, and when she turned around, her pretty little butt twitched so nice and all. She knocked me out. I, I mean it. I was half in love with her by the time we sat down. That's the thing about girls. Every time they do something pretty, even if they're not much to look at, or even if they're sort of stupid, you have to fall in love with them, and then you never know where the hell you are. Girls, Jesus Christ, they can drive you crazy. They really can. They didn't invite me to sit down at the table, mostly because they were too ignorant. But I sat down anyway. The blonde I'd been dancing with's name was Bernice something. Crabs, Krebs. The two ugly ones' names were Marty and Laverne. I told them my name was Jim Steele, just for the hell of it. Then I tried to get them in a little intelligent conversation, but it's practically impossible. You had to twist their arms. You could hardly tell which was the stupidest of the three of them. And the whole three of them kept looking all around the goddamn room. Like, as if they're expecting, as if they expected a flock of goddamn movie stars to come in any minute. They probably thought movie stars always hung out in the lavender room when they came to New York, instead of the Stork Club or El Morocco and all. Anyway, it took me about half an hour to find out where they all worked and all in Seattle. They all worked in the same insurance office. I asked them if they liked it. But do you think you could get an intelligent answer out of one of those three dopes? I thought the two ugly ones, Marty and Laverne, were sisters, but they got very insulted when I asked them. You could tell neither of them wanted to look like the other one, and you couldn't blame them. But it was very amusing anyway. I danced with them, the whole three of them, one at a time. The ugly one, Laverne, wasn't too bad a dancer, but the other one, old Marty, was murder. Old Marty was like dragging the Statue of Liberty around the floor. The only way I could even half enjoy myself dragging her around was if I amused myself a little. So I told her I just saw Gary Cooper, the movie star, on the other side of the floor. Where? She asked me, excited as hell. Where? Oh, uh, you just missed him. He just went out. Why didn't you look when I told you? She practically stopped dancing and started looking over everybody's head to see if she could, could see him. Oh, shoot, she said. I just about broke her heart. I really had. I was sorry as hell I'd kidded her. Some people shouldn't kid, even if they deserve it. Here's what was very funny, though. When we got back to the table, old Marty told the other two that Gary Cooper had just got out, gone out. Boy, old Laverne and Bernice nearly committed suicide when they heard that. They got all excited and asked Marty if she'd seen him and all. Old Mark said she'd only caught a glimpse of him. That killed me. The bar was closing up for the night, so I bought them all two drinks apiece quick before it closed, and I ordered two more Cokes for myself. The goddamn table was lousy with glasses, but the one ugly one, Laverne, kept kidding me because I was only drinking Cokes. She had a sterling sense of humor. She and old Marty were drinking Tom Collins's in the middle of December, for God's sakes. They didn't know any better. The blonde one, old Bernice, was drinking bourbon and water. She was really putting it away, too. The whole three of them kept looking for movie stars the whole time. They hardly talked even to each other. Old Marty talked more than the other two. She kept saying these very corny, boring things, like calling the can lo the little girl's room. And she thought Buddy Singer's poor old beat-up clarinet player was really terrific when he stood up and took a couple of ice-cold hot licks. She called his clarinet a licorice stick. Was she corny? The other ugly one, Laverne, thought she was a very witty type. She kept asking me to call up my father and ask him what he was doing tonight. She kept asking me if my father had a date or not. Four times she asked me that. She was certainly witty, old Bernice, the blonde one. 
didn't say hardly anything at all. Every time I'd ask her something, she said, what? That can get on your nerves after a while. All of a sudden, when they finished their drink, all three of them stood up on me and said they had to get to bed. They said they were going to get up early to see the first show at Radio City Music Hall. I tried to get them to stick around for a while, but they wouldn't. So we said goodbye and, and all. I told them I'd look up in Seattle. I'd look them up in Seattle sometime if I ever got there. But I doubt if I ever will. Look them up, I mean. With the cigarettes and all, the check came to about 13 bucks. I think they should have at least offered to pay for the drinks they had before I joined them. I wouldn't have let them naturally, but they should have at least offered. I didn't care much, though. They were so ignorant, and they had those sad, fancy hats on and all. And that business about getting up early to see the first show at Radio City Music Hall depressed me. If somebody, some girl in an awful looking hat, for instance, comes all the way to New York from Seattle, Washington, for God's sake, and ends up getting up early in the morning to see the goddamn first show at Radio City Music Hall, it makes me so depressed I can't stand it. I'd have bought the whole three of them a hundred drinks if only they had told me that. I left the lavender room pretty soon after that. They were closing up anyway, and the band had quit a long time ago. In the first place, it was one of those places that are very terrible to be in unless you have somebody good to dance with or unless the waiter lets you buy real drinks instead of just Cokes. There isn't any nightclub in the world you can sit in for a long time unless you can at least buy some liquor and get drunk or unless you're with some girl that really knocks you out. Okay, end of chapter 10. So I'm gonna stop the share for a second. That's chapter 10. I hope that the rain enhanced the reading. I hope that you could hear it. Um, it's still raining here. It's not as heavy, but it is still raining. And I'm not sure what day of the week or month of the year you'll watch this video, but it's July right now um, where I am. So it's like a nice, warm, rainy summer day. So with that said, um, we just finished chapter 10, Catcher in the Rye. And Holden's out. He's at the lavender room. He's ready to rebel. He's not going home anytime soon. He's going to stay out all night. And he even um, insults the girls. He says, hey, you come all the way from Seattle, Washington to New York City, like, and you're going to go home early to get the early show at Radio City Music Hall? Like, that's no way to live. Um, but yeah, he is ready to be out and he wants to drink and he wants to party and he's certainly not going to go to bed early and we'll get more into that so holden has some vices they're called so vice you know vice and virtue so virtues are these attributes that we all have that you know are considered to be positive and they're lovely right the, the loveliest things you could list about yourself and everybody has them right you all have beautiful virtues um, and then there's vices. So the vices are the attributes about ourselves that aren't so great, that we have to work on, that make us not the best versions of ourselves. And sometimes these, these vices can turn into like bad habits too. So we'll talk more about Holden's virtues and vices in another chapter, but some of the, the vices and virtues do start coming out as we experience Holden in these different moments. So we, we saw him talking and interacting with girls and we're in his head so we get some of his internal monologue and sometimes he says really sweet things about girls and other times he's super critical, right? And he's condescending and he's patronizing and he says things that you're like, I, if I were a girl his age, I would not want to hang out with him, right? He's not saying things that make me want to like go you know, run out and spend the evening dancing and having a good time. Like, I'm not interested in, in him based on some of the things that he says and the critique that he has of these girls. He's, he's not so nice at times. But then there are other moments where he is. So he has, like, these two sides from, like, right, the, the angel and the devil on each shoulder, where he can be very sweet and charming and kind. So he's, he is, you know, this human. He's very human, and that's what makes him a great character. 
and he will get into he's sort of, he's a character called an anti-hero which is he follows like the same cycle as a traditional hero would and like we'll use odysseus as our example when we do that lesson um the hero cycle of like a character that was like larger than life you know had the this role that filled the story with just, you know, being a hero in, in all of its glory. But the anti-hero is more like Holden, where there's, there's a lot of, you know, virtues to the character, but there's also all of these very obvious vices. And Odysseus had vices too, but they, you know, his virtues were what were being celebrated. So we'll talk a little bit about those human qualities that everybody has. And like our, you know, N needing to examine that, right? To examine what our virtues are and our vices and to sort of work on those. Like, right, if you, you know, notice yourself and you start to consider your strengths and maybe your weaknesses, you can begin to have that awareness to, oh, a better version of me would do this and make some of those choices. So that's where Holden is too. He needs to sort of evaluate who he is and what choices he's making because, you know, he's in a place where he, there is a lot of uncertainty. So with that, I'm going to go back. I just wanted to have a chat about that because you, it, that really comes up for me in this chapter where you see these two sides to Holden. There's like the dark side and the light side. And so just to mention it, and we'll keep, we'll keep digging into that. Um, but it is like his, we, we're, we're going to see Holden continue to rebel and to bump into some of these different characteristics of himself. So with that, I just want to share with you the screen again and get into our notes. So in our notes, and you can look at these a little more carefully, I put them in the description. There's some fun stuff in this chapter about the 1950s, like pop culture. So they do this dance called the Jitterbug. I'm just going to pull it up for a second. And again, I'll put it in the description of the video. The Jitterbug was a super popular dance. He mentions Jitterbugging on the dance floor. Looks like this. Oh, let's get to the good part. This is the Jitterbug. This is what they're doing on the dance floor. Just a little taste of that. You can watch more of it if you want. Um, that's the jitterbug. That's the dance that they're doing. And so if you want a little bit more history about the jitterbug, where this dance came from and why this is the popular dance during the 1950s when Holden's out there on the dance floor in New York City. He's in New York City. So, you know, he's in a an epicenter of culture. So he's not somewhere in the far corners of the earth where they just aren't caught up with the times. Like he's in a place where culturally they're doing what's you know popular and current and they're they're making they're making the trend so he's you know he's well versed in what is popular um at that moment and so the jitterbug is something that was popular and again that's the video but here's some more information about that dance and why it became popular and then the other thing that we we're going to bump into a few times is this whole drinking um, alcohol. So this video is kind of nice. Um, Holden is 16 in the story, so he is not of the legal age to drink, though he does try to drink a lot. So this is a nice little video that gives you sort of like a time lapse from the prohibition to today, um, the changing drinking ages in the United States, because that's something I'm sure you've heard before, that the drinking age has sort of shifted and changed, and it depends on the state, too. That's a state, right, um, where the, the age of how old you can be to buy drinks, order drinks, 
has changed based on state laws. So this gets into that a little bit, and we'll talk more about that because it does come up quite a bit in this story. Um, but just so you know, if you're wondering about the drinking ages and what those were, this map's kind of interesting. And then again, just the focus that this is Holden rebelling. So we'll keep digging into that theme of, rebell of rebelling and peeling back some of the layers about why Holden feels like he doesn't fit in and doesn't want to conform and the need that he has right now to rebel. And then with that, that is it for this chapter. I'm not going to give any additional assignments. So um, just keep up with your work. And thank you for listening. So we'll stop the share now. Just to say goodbye. So again, thank you for checking in and reading chapter 10 of Catcher in the Rye. And I will see you soon for chapter 11. All right, bye.